Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about these neat enzymes called restriction endonucleases. And sometimes I will call them instead of restriction endonucleases, uh, just restriction enzymes. And a lot of scientists just call them restriction enzymes. It's easier to say. Uh, technically, they are endonucleases because they cut within DNA molecules. So what are these, these enzymes? Um, it might help to quickly take a look at how they were discovered. So let's say this is a bacterium of E. coli and it comes from a strain or it is a member of strain C. Now, I think this is back in the 60s, scientists were studying infection of strain C with a bacteriophage called uh, lambda phage. And when they would infect strain C with the bacteriophage, the bacteriophage has a double-stranded DNA genome. I'll put the DNA in there. What they would get is lots of uh, virus produced. So lots of the bacteriophage would pre be produced. Lots of the bacteriophage particles would be produced during an infection of strain C. However, when they did the same thing with a different strain of E. coli, so same species, different strain, strain K plus the virus, same virus, called bacteriophage. Viruses that infect bacteria are called the bacteriophages. Not much virus was produced, suggesting that it couldn't really infect strain, C, strain K. So maybe it could infect a little bit, um, but, but virus levels were really low during infection of strain K. So strain K was called the restricting host. And it was found that it's the restricting host because it has a restriction enzyme that specifically cuts a sequence within the DNA of uh, the phage the bacteriophage that was used to infect strain K. Strain C didn't have that enzyme, and that's why the, the infection produced lots of virus. So that's where that term restriction endonuclease comes from. So scientists, since then, scientists have identified over 3,000 restriction endonucleases. Over 600 of these can be purchased from biotechnology companies for researchers to use in their experiments. So any experiment in molecular geneticists would need to, to cut DNA of a certain sequence. Well, the, the scientist just needs to order, you know, one of these 600 enzymes from a company and well, okay, you got this enzyme, you can cut the DNA in a specific way. So let's see how these enzymes cut DNA. So they have names like this. So Hindi-3 is a popular restriction endonuclease. The name, the first three letters, usually come from the bacterium that, that possesses the enzyme in nature. So Hindi, H is for Haemophilus. The IN is for influenza or influenzae. I don't know how to say that or pronounce that, uh, strain RD. So I guess that's where the D comes from. And three is usually the, the, this is the third restriction enzyme identified from this bacterium. So this enzyme, if you were to mix it with a solution of DNA, what it would do is it would look for DNA or it would bind to DNA of a certain sequence. And this sequence is six nucleotides or six base pairs long. And it's uh, comprised of uh, this sequence, A, A, G, C, T, T. 
And the complement here is right there. And we can kind of see a palindrome here, right? So uh, we have this AAGCTT right here. And then if you look the other way, we see AAGCTT right here in the opposite strand. Uh, so it's a pallet, it's like an inverted palindrome there. And a palindrome being uh, a series of characters that reads the same forward and backwards. So AAGCTT there, and then we have AAGCTT there. So how would this cut? How would this enzyme cut this sequence? Well, it would cut right here, or this one cuts the phosphodiester backbone between these two A's here, and the phosphodiester backbone between those two A's there. And what happens is it creates uh, two new DNA ends in this DNA molecule. We can imagine that the DNA goes that way. Uh, and these ends are going to be called sticky ends. So let me diagram that down here. So we're going to end up with an A here, with a three prime hydroxyl there. And down here we'll have the T. And let's say the DNA goes on this way. And the bases are whatever, it doesn't matter what those are. And we have a T here, a C here, oh, C here, G here, and A here. And then we have a phosphate group right here on the five prime end. So that's the five prime end. This is the three prime. That's five prime. This is three prime. So you can see that this end right here is going to be pulled away from this end up here. So that's going to, it's going to be called a sticky end because of this overhang right here. It's going to tend to stick to another sticky end where the bases are complementary. So let me show you the other sticky end that this could stick to. So up here, A, G, C, T, T, A, G, C, T, T. Here's the phosphodiester backbone. Here's the phosphate group. Here are some other bases. The sequence doesn't matter. Here's the A right here. Bases down here don't matter. And oh, this is a OH, let me see. Yes, OH group here, because this is the three prime end. Okay, it's going to look something like this. So this DNA molecule with the sequence AAGCTT will be cut by Hindi 3 in this pattern right here. It cuts between these two bases and these two bases. It cuts the phosphodiester backbone, leaves phosphate groups on the five prime ends and hydroxyl groups on the three prime ends, and leaves these four base overhangs. See how it's kind of overhanging this end over here? And these are complementary. See this T is complementary to that A, C to G, G to C, and A to T. So that's where that sticky end turn or phrase comes from. And why are they sticky? Because they can form hydrogen bonds. However, they don't stay together very well because there's no covalent bonds between this O and this P. Those covalent bonds were broken by the restriction enzyme. And the sticky ends are going to be important uh, a little later in the video. So let's take a look at another one. So not all enzymes, restriction enzymes, leave sticky ends when they are used to digest DNA. And restriction enzymes are pretty neat, right? Because they are naturally occurring enzymes that you know, scientists discovered and all of a sudden we have a really, we can use these in research and they're a really useful tool for studying genetics. So ALU1, and remember we had the ALU elements in, uh, in humans and I believe the ALU elements in humans derive their names from a restriction enzyme with, uh, I don't know if it's ALU1 or ALU2 or ALU3, but that's where this ALU, we're seeing this ALU again, and it is somewhat related to the ALU elements in humans because of the way the ALU, ALU elements uh, give, a, I think, an interesting 300 base pair pattern when you digest 
the human genome with uh, this particular enzyme, or at least a restriction enzyme that starts with ALU. So this enzyme was found in bacteria, uh, Arthrobacter luteus. So, so many different bacteria out there, right? Um, they probably all have different restriction enzymes. You know, I don't know if all bacteria use restriction enzymes to defend themselves from viruses, but they might. But uh, clearly a lot of them do. So ALU1 cuts, and sometimes we use the word digests instead of cuts. So digests the sequence AGCT. So unlike Hindi 3, which cuts uh, six, a six base pair sequence, so binds a six base pair sequence, and the sequence has to, has to be very precise, has to be that exact sequence for Hindi 3 to bind the DNA. ALU1 binds a four base sequence, and it has to be this specific sequence in order for ALU1 to bind it and cut it. And where does it cut? It cuts once up here and once down there. And that's going to leave DNA ends that are called blunt ends. So we'll have the five prime, let's call this the three prime end right here. So OH here, phosphate here, phosphate is going to be there, right? Because these are phosphodiester linkages that are being broken by the enzyme and they're leaving behind hydroxyls and phosphates. And we can pretend these, this is the middle of a very long molecule right here, and we just cut it with ALU1. So, okay, we have something that looks like this. And some of you are probably thinking, well, how could we could put this back together, right? If we added DNA ligase. Well, DNA ligase would take this and it would link that phosphate to that hydroxyl and this phosphate to that hydroxyl. Okay, so that's how ALU1 works. Um, Okay, so one of the two things we saw so far, we saw two different recognition sequences, right? Recognition sequences. Now those are the sequences that are recognized by restriction endonucleases. Hindi 3 recognizes the sequence AAGC. TT. I won't put the complementary strand in here. So it recognizes a six base pair recognition sequence and ALU1 recognizes a four base pair recognition sequence uh, and it was AGCT. Okay, so uh, that's it for now and, and we'll talk a little bit more about restriction enzymes in um, the, maybe this video, but the next segment of this video.